In the early 1960s, Michael Rockefeller disappeared off of the coast of Papua New Guinea in an event that shocked the nation. Years later, the true fate of the heir to the oil fortune has been revealed to be more shocking than ever imagined. Dun, dun, dun. That's what we're talking about today. This is Laughs from the Past. Thanks for joining. Thank you guys very much for joining. This is the last episode of season one of Last from the Past. If you've been listening along the way, we appreciate you. If you're just joining this one because you've been Googling Michael Rockefeller stories or Papua New Guinea stories, thanks. First note, we just had a little uh, discussion, so I'm guessing a lot of people like you, Jake, think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Maybe I am in America, but Papua is how uh, they said it in Australia. When I lived in Australia, that's how they said it because... Australia used to own, well, that's a weird term. Australia mm. used to be the, what's the word for it? Owners? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the history of Papua New Guinea and Australia, so I don't know what you're going for. Like they, like they what, colonized Like what it. Britain used to be to Australia? Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. No. Well, anyway, this, this show, if you're a first-time listener, is I, I tell a story from history. I have an article here. Uh, Jake's hearing it for the first time. This one I didn't know about before, but I have a general knowledge of history because I was a history major and I just read things all the time. And uh, Jake makes jokes. I make jokes too. Jake might be better at jokes. But uh, this is a crazy story. It was sent in to us by, oh shit, I had, I had it pulled up earlier. James, I think was his first name that started with an M, his second name. He sent in the story, said it would be a good one for the podcast. And I, I agree with him. So it is. We had one more spot to fill before we move on to season two, which will season two will cover one subject matter. So this is a good story, Jake, and I have a good article about it. What do you know offhand about like the Rockefellers? Let's start with the Rockefellers, because this this story is the Rockefellers and Papua New Guinea, and they collided. Right. So so just basic knowledge uh, and we'll have the, you know, get the listeners up to speed. What's your basic knowledge about Rockefeller? Is it just? I, I want to say. I mean, Rockefellers are one of one of the early known U.S. families, kind of that wasn't fully tied into politics. I guess you you think back of names and families in history; it's usually tied to politics. I want to say Rockefellers were steel? Question mark. I think that was Car- the best that, that was that was Carnage or whatever. Oh, Carnegie? I think Carnegie was steel. I'm thinking of the Bessemer process, which is how they made steel. Wow, it's funny what the brain learns sometimes. Yeah, the Carnegie was steel. Rockefeller was oil. Okay. So what So So yeah, I mean two so the two <laughs> almost big New York kind of related families. I mean, you think of Rockefeller Center. You think of Carnegie Hall or steel and oil, which was kind of how this this great country was made back in the day. Yeah. John D. Rockefeller's story, which is he's the main guy. His dad was like a criminal petty thief and his mom. I don't know, but he him and his brother started Rockefeller oil, which what what he he is the richest single man in the history of the United States. John D. Rockefeller. He started Standard Oil which was basically like everyone was making money off oil at the refineries and then selling it. And he was the one that made like kerosene and uh, started the standard oil company, which took it from this big thing and refined it into a, like, okay, now you can buy it for your household like this. Right. Uh, Which is crazy. He had a monopoly. He owned 90% of the oil at one point. And then the U S was like, yo, you can't do this. So they split uh, Standard Oil into 30 different companies, which like Exxon became its own, Chevron became its own, and a ton others. Uh, so wh- wh- who we're talking about is his great grandson, because Rockefeller was in born in 1839. He died in 1937. Yeah, how about that? 98 years. Yeah, it's 
crazy. And his grandson is Michael. This is his great grandson. So his grandson's son, obviously, you know how that works. Michael Rockefeller, mm-hmm. who I guess didn't he, he didn't really have an inter- interest in taking on, over the company, the richest person in the world. Right. Um, so that's one part of the story we're talking about, the rich of the rich of the rich. There's a cool story about John D. Rockefeller. He was supposed to be on this train uh, to go to a business meeting before he was rich. And the train crashed and everyone died. Like all 50 passengers died. And his luggage was on the train because whoever was taking care of his luggage, like ha- got it there on time, but he didn't get there in time. So that's a big missed death. Yeah. And then final destination never caught up to him. You know, he's supposed to die. Instead, he went on to be the richest man in the history of the U S death missed him and just forgot about it. He was and, like, never mind. Yeah. yeah. I got, uh, I'll, I'll get the rest. <laughs> 49 out of 50. We're good. Death. Come on. Be cool. Be cool. Death. All right. And then Papua New Guinea. What do you know about Papua New Guinea? Gorgeous this time of year. No, I mean, we, we, uh, <laughs> be some silly audio that like three people would laugh here. And cause it, it's you and me talking very naturally. I've only heard it called Papua New Guinea. And again, I don't know if that's Americanized or just my natural bad brain or being ignorant or a combo of all three. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you had me point at a map before this, that would have been ugly. Like, I, I don't even know if I would have been in the Pacific, Jim. It's above Australia. Right. So Australia has, if you look at Australia on, on the right side, the, uh, the north east of Australia, like our main they have this big point that's Queensland. Um, good surf there. I visit. I went there for Christmas. Oh, yeah. I went there for Christmas one year back in 1998, probably. Maybe 90. No, 99. I did the Outback. It was 98. Mm. I lived in Australia for two years when I was a kid. Hey, you get paid it in some barrels out there. And wow. <laughs> <laughs> Surfer's Paradise is what it's called in Queensland, New- Australia. But anyway, Papua New-, Papua New Guinea was above that. So when I was in school... Um, Back then in the late 90s in Australia, Papua New Guinea was always the people we were helping. Like, save the cans, send the cans, there's donations, drives. Australia, much like how Australia was Britain's little pet project, like we're going to colonize this, we're going to take care of this, Australia very much wanted to do that for Papua New Guinea. So there's actually an island called New Guinea, and it was split up. Like, the Dutch owned the, the half of it, the Australians owned the Dutch. If you split it in half, the Dutch owned the left half. And then the right half was split in half again, owned half by the Germans, half by the Australians. And it just kept going. Now it's its own nation. But they say that Papua New Guinea is one of the most culturally diverse countries because within itself is not one nation. It's just a bunch of tribes. There's like 80 different languages they have the Highland people who are completely different culture than the Papua region, which is the South. That is, then there's like the islands, like the Florida Keys of New Guinea. And the island culture is completely different. So it's supposed to be the most culturally diverse little island. It's crazy. It's really rural. It's the most amount of people uh, that don't live in cities in a country. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was going to say tribal, but I didn't want it. I feel like if I said tribal and it wasn't, that's like offensive. So I, I shied away from it. No, man, it's tribal. It is the most tribal. It is where cannib- cannibalism like gets its roots. Mm. And that's what this story is about. Oh, boy. Um, um, and I mean, we're we're talking when you say island vibes, too. I mean, we're talking like Tiki Hut type stuff, too. Like yep. it's more... Because when you say Australia, I don't think that an Australian island, I don't think you naturally get like tiki type vibes. But that's kind of what's going on here, right? Super undeveloped, super uh, like untouched tribes they talk about. Uh, Papua Guinea has a lot of them. Um, Yeah, really native. Yeah. Uh, If we do, if I Google, do a quick Papua Papua New Guinea houses, they have houses now. But yeah, very like, like tiki. Old school. Third world. Okay. Now, what, what year is my great-grandson Rockefeller in, in PPG? PPNG? It says the early 1960s. Okay. 
All right. So I have the story here. So that's kind of a background of both uh, of, of Papua New Guinea and the Rockefellers and all this. So you have the richest of the richest of the first world country going to the poorest of the poorest undeveloped third world. So the juxtaposition is crazy. Um, Michael Rockefeller was born in 1938, the son of Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York State. He was the latest in a dynasty of millionaires founded by the great-grandfather and possibly the richest man to have ever lived, John D. Rockefeller. Um, Though his father expected him to follow his footsteps and manage the vast business assets of the family, Michael was a quieter, more artistic spirit. When he graduated from Harvard in 1960, Michael wanted to do something more exciting than sitting around in boardrooms and conducting meetings in offices. If you have the money, you know what I mean? Like, he's a millionaire. He probably has a trust fund. Why would you... Why would you want to go be the boss of like a grueling business? Like, yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like he's the first one in the family that had some hippie wonderlust going on. 1960s, it, it adds right yeah. up. But also, um, like, I can own, totally understand like heirs of the family being like, well, I'm going to have this money that grandpa made anyway. Right. So I'd rather just not do the hard work. I mean, it sucks because, you know, you've you got to do the hard work. You can't live off your parents. But it's kind of like, well, I mean, I can kind of live off grandpa because he's the richest isn't, man that ever lived. Isn't this part of the reason that they work so hard was <laughs> to kind of pass it on and keep the family thing going? Yeah. yeah I mean, I would totally, because it also turns into a family pride thing and showing face and that kind of stuff. So you, I mean, my snaky way to do it would be find a role where I could show face, but still not do much. I People would say bad stuff about me. I I would get like the, like the chief marketing officer position. And they'd be like, we don't have a marketing department. Yeah. No, I'm we're doing a great standard, job. We're standard oil. Yeah. But yeah, at the same time, I'd be like, guys, here's the deal. Like I could either come in a couple times a week and. Okay. So you guys don't want me coming in the office. All right, fine. I'm out. <laughs> How good of a company name is standard oil? Yeah. Strong. It's really strong. And what do we do? Oil. And it's also like General what, General Electric. It's a great what, company name. What's the message we want to get across to our customers? Uh, this is a standard. <laughs> this is the this is the standard. Yeah, it's just perfect. We're not the <laughs> yeah. It's great. Uh, yeah, company names were a lot better. And I know this comes into like almost a stand up routine. Like every joke's been done, and like a lot of company names have been done at this point, but. Now all the new companies, Trello, Zello, um, you're you're making up words that sound cool. Google, Twitter, all that, like General Electric. Yeah, Standard That's Oil. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. So his dad was a prof- prolific art collector and had recently opened a museum of primitive art. And the exhibits of this collection, including Nigerian, pretty Colombian, Aztec, and Mayan artistic works, entranced Michael. So he sees these primitive arts and he says, that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to be on the board of your museum and I want to help curate art of these primitive cultures. I want to go and take photos and learn and share these people, which actually it's not like he wanted to be a lazy bum. He just didn't want to do like the standard oil. Like if it, I think that's an honorable position, like let me be the head of your museum that I can still help the company while doing my passion. Yeah, I'll be I'll be the artsy guy in the family. I'm you respect respect that I like art and I'm willing to still bring that to the family trust somehow. Yes. Yeah, so, so he wanted to do something that hadn't been done before, bring a major collection to art. Uh, Michael traveled extensively. He had traveled extensively already, living in Japan and Venezuela for months at a time because he's rich as fuck and why not? And he was an anthropology he was like into anthropology which is cool. So after uh, talking with representatives from the Dutch National Museum of Ethnology, the Dutch at this time were in control of uh, New Guinea. Um, and New Guinea is the whole island, and Papua New Guinea is like just a part of it. Uh, but So the let me skip forward a little bit. Dutch are in control. He gets uh, a group of researchers and documentarians to accompany on this trip and decided to make a scouting trip to the region. He visited the Ost- I'm not going to say this right. It's O T S Ots J A N E P Ochtenip. Not there's no way I'm saying that right. Ochtenip okay. tribe, um, which is an Azmat community on the island, where he took pictures and unsuccessfully attempted to purchase 
beach poles, intricately carved wooden artifacts from the locals. So he's trying to spread their culture. And they're like, who are you? Why is your skin so white? Um, at the time, war between villages was common. So the Papua New Guinea people talk about before the light and after the light. And the light is the white men and Christianity that they brought to the island. And before the light, they were so cold. They just fought all the time between tribes. Like war was part of their life, tribe to tribe. I don't even know why. Or why. I think it was just like, okay, time for a battle. I don't think they were trying to conquer each other's land or people. You know what I mean? Like the Romans were trying to conquer land. I think in Papua New Guinea, they were just like, let's just fight. I've got a, the first thing that jumped into my head. Again, I, I feel like I'm tiptoeing a lot today. But the first thing that came to my head when you said that they're like constantly fighting, I basically picked the Euro League soccer standings. And basically, like the tribes are constantly fighting and it's almost like a pecking order. <laughs> like, oh, we, we just lost to those guys. We dropped from 12th to 14th tribe. Is that like offensive? Should I stop talking? No, I- that's, that's why I'm picturing. That's why in my head I'm picturing them fighting like, they're not necessarily ga- gaining land. They're almost gaining status. I think what you're saying and what I'm saying is the same thing. And the, the, the middle ground that you just found is it was a sport for them. Okay. War yeah. was more of a sport than like to conquer people. Like it, was, okay. like it was like, let's go play soccer. But instead we're killing each other with spears. But I have no idea. This is, that's just, it just seems that way. Um, War between villages was common, and Asmat warriors often took the heads of their enemies and ate their flesh. In certain regions, Asmat men would engage in homosexual sex, and in bizarre bonding rituals, they would sometimes drink each other's urine. Mm. Sounds like they just had a good time. Yeah, party in. Don't judge a guy on his celebrations after battle. You don't know what they've just been through. If they want to eat some brain, fuck, and drink urine, let them. That's not how I'd do it. Well, I'd, you don't know that. I'd probably have some beers, take a nap. You, you weren't there. You weren't there in the 60s. I wasn't. I wasn't. But Michael Rockefeller was. And yeah. he said, now this is a wild and somehow more remote country than what I've ever seen before. And it was. It's, the mo- it's still the, one of the most remote countries. <laughs> um, with severely limited contact with the outside world, the Asmat believed the land beyond their island to be inhabited by spirits. And when white people came from across the sea, they saw them as some kind of supernatural beings. So I also read this in another, another article. They were like headhunting was a thing and they would collect the skulls and they would, they found like in late into like the seventies, they found rooms just full of skulls. Uh, and it was kind of like trophy cases very much. Like we said, it was a sport. It, the more skulls you had, the the bigger, the better you were, the more females you got, the more like a power you got. It was like a currency to be kill people and keep their skull. Sure. Fuck, man. I'm so glad I was born not in Papua New Guinea in the 1900s. Uh, so let me skip forward. So he sets out for Papua New Guinea again in 1961 to go back. As they approached the Ostrinip Sea by sea, I'm so upset that I don't know how to pronounce that, but I... You know. I like you fighting through it. No, don't look it up. Okay. You're looking it up. Okay. Well, I will, I will, I, 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 I'm going to say Ots. In the, in the chat, can you text me the letters? Because I, I missed it. I, 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 the champ wants to take a hack. Okay. Uh, and I am sending the letters to Jake so he can try and pronounce right there. Oh, boy. Now, do we think, and again, this is, do you think this is, part of the Dutch influence that the C is named that? Or do you think this is like an Indian name or what is that? Cause the letters you just sent me. Take a shot. You haven't right. even taken a shot. And you have to say it how I don't think there's an alternate. Ots <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Let's just call it Ots. Ots Yanep. If, uh, if, it is if it's Dutch, then the J is a Y. Ots Yanep. That sounds a little better. Or Ots Yanep. Oceanup. Yeah. Girls that want to have fun. <laughs> that was quick. Uh, I'm going to call it Ots. As they approached the Ots by sea along the coast of the island on November 19th, 1961, their boat capsized. 
Though they were 12 miles from shore, no idea how they know that back in 19, well, in 1961, maybe they do. Um, Rockefeller reportedly told an anthropologist on his expedition, I think I can make it, and jumped into the waters. Mm, good start. He was never seen again, okay? Right. So, I mean, your boat capsizes 12 miles from shore. Like, I think I got this. Uh, good for good for Michael. Twelve miles. That's what they're saying. I don't know if. Yeah, that, that sounds like one of those. Again, history changes the story a little bit. Yeah. Um, Started a little over a mile, and then someone said like one point two miles, and now twenty eighteen. Yeah, twelve miles. Everything gets longer in the retelling. You know that. Just, just shift that decimal, babe. For everyone that doesn't know, that's a quote from Sea Biscuit that I just said, and you should go watch Sea Biscuit. Mm. Uh, so. He's never to be seen again. So Nelson Rockefeller and his wife, they fly to New Guinea to help search for their son. There's helicopters, there's boats, there's technology that New Guinea has never seen looking for his son. They never find him. The final report is that he drowned, right? Sure. It was a media sensation, they say. Of course it is. One of the richest people in the world. One of the richest people in the world dies in the most uh, poorest countries in the world. Of course that's going to be. Other rumors claimed he was living somewhere in the jungle of New Guinea, escaping from the gilded cage of his wealth. But the Dutch denied all these rumors, saying that they were unable to discover what happened to him. How? Can I say one? Oh. Can I say say, say 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 one thing on the record that's off the record? Yeah, you want to put parentheses around this? Like yes and no, but I like I don't want to because if I'm right, cool. I'm not a conspiracy theory guy. There's some new Tupac rumors coming out. It's Suge Knight's kid. I just think like that's the story that 2019 needs. Like Tupac was alive. We're all suckers. What do you mean Suge Knight's kid? Suge Knight's kid is out like hunting for Tupac and like believes he knows where he is. Interesting. Okay, so you do, you- and, 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 and in his, I guess he's been like tweeting this out, and he's intermittently he's been tweeting like, "I'm not on drugs or anything." <laughs> That's Hilarious funny. defense. My my favorite that my you're on drugs. My that's fucked up. Tupac's mom, if uh, if she like buried her son and saw the body and shit, that's fucked up. Yeah, that's true. Um, Andy, what was the comedian's name? Andy Dick. No, no, no. The one that died in the 70s. It was crazy. Oh. Here I come to save the day. Yeah, Jim Carrey played him. Um, I'm blanking on his name. I'm so mad at myself. Yeah, I, I almost need you to not tell me. I have all other famous Andys coming up. Andy Warhol's on the front of my brain. Oh, thank you very much. Kaufman. Thank God. That was annoying. Andy Kaufman. I, yeah. There was a lot of people that thought Andy Kaufman faked his death because he right. always did crazy shit like that. It, that sucks. If that does come out, I mean, he would have done it by now. You know, I don't know how long you're going to wait. But if that did come out 10 years later, he's like, I'm, I'm alive. That would have been awesome. Would have been so cool. Unfortunately, I think he really died. Yeah, he very much really did die. And like so super sad scenes when he's telling people he has cancer and nobody believes him because he's a prankster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy Kaufman's my speed of comedy, man. Yeah. A comedian that just wants to make himself laugh and not the audience. Like, I'm sorry, audience, but that's my speed. When he had a show and everyone came to see him do comedy and then he just stood up there and read of Mice and Men from first page to last page in a very serious yeah. manner, that I wouldn't want to sit there and watch that. But knowing that he did that is fucking hilarious to me. Yeah, I'm I'm such a blind sucker for his alternate character tony clifton <laughs> um like that's <laughs> that's like a ch- that's like a 10 percent of my humor that doesn't come out a lot <laughs> but the tony clifton man that stuff is paralysis for me oh you guys want to see andy kaufman this comedian you're absolutely in love with and he you know he just brings the biggest smile to your face well, here's Tony Clifton, the town asshole, <laughs> who's not even not even like jokes asshole. Like, oh, that's a that's a good shirt. I I thought I threw that away last week. It's like, no, your your wife is fat, and so are you. <laughs> You're like, oh my god. Have you watched the documentary about when Jim Curry Jim Carrey made the movie? Yes, it's insane. 
It's insane. All right. Anyway, so, so like Tupac and like, uh, like Tupac and like Andy Kaufman, people thought that Rockefeller didn't actually die because they didn't know what happened. Back to the story. Because there is a big, however, mm. in 2014, Carl Hoffman, a reporter for the National Geographic, real revealed in his book that many of the Netherlands inquiries about the matter resulted in evidence that the asthmat killed Michael. Not that he drowned. Two Dutch missionaries on the island, both of whom had lived among the asthmat for years and spoke their language, told local authorities that they had heard from the asthmat that some of them had killed Michael Rockefeller. The police officer sent to investigate the crime the following year Wim Wal Da Wall. <laughs> Tough. Dude, I gotta send you this. I gotta send you this name. I read this article earlier yesterday, but I'd never I didn't like try to pronounce this name. Pronounce that name on your first shot. Go. Vim Vandeval. <laughs> Vim Vandeval. Wim 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 Vandeval. It's a pretty good name. Um the Dutch Dutch is such good a good Dutch name. name. Good Dutch. You name. ever heard someone speak Dutch? It's the most bizarre sounding language. A little bit. My soccer camps growing up were normally ran by Dutch people. Funny people. Yeah. Probably. Very silly. Yeah. Very silly. All right. So Wim van de Waal, he was sent to investigate the crime back then, came to the same conclusion and even produced a skull that the asthmat claimed was Michael Rockefeller. So this was back when it actually happened. What the problem was is the Dutch were about to lose the land and they wanted to make, they did not want reports that they could not control these people out. So they hid the fact that he, like when this came back, the Dutch were like, we can't let this out. He drowned. We cannot tell them that our inhabitants uh, mauled. Like, I mean, imagine. Right, right. Dutch colonization kills and eats richest man in the world's great grandson. You can't have that headline if you're the Dutch. Not it's a good a tough headline. Yeah. Tough headline. Um, by 1962, the Dutch had already lost half of their claim to Papua New Guinea to the new state of Indonesia uh, and were fearful that if it were believed they could not control the native population, it would. So Indonesia was under control and uh, the Dutch, and they broke free. And then Indonesia was like, and we want that fucking island too. And they'd sent battleships to try and take it by force, and they just got like crushed. And then... I think like th there were treaties and powers and the rest of the country was like, give it to him. Just give it yeah. to him. Um, so Hoffman uh, is the National Geographic in 2014 investigator. So he goes there with an interpreter um, and he hears people telling like, don't talk about that to American tourists. Don't talk about it. Because what happened was, well, I'll get, I'll go in order. Um, Hoffman fiend ignorance asked the man who he was. Uh, he t he was and he asked the man who they were talking about. He t he was told it was Michael Rockefeller. He learned that it was common knowledge on the island that the Asmat people of Ots killed him killed a white man and that it should not be mentioned for fear of reprisals. He also learned that the killing of Rockefeller was a reprisal in its own right. So in 1957, just three years before Rockefeller first visited the island. There had been an event that would forever scar the people of Atsjanop. At that point, the Dutch colonial, colonial government had recently taken control of the island and had limited control of the remote Asmat people. So that year, a massacre occurred between two Asmat tribes when the Ots and Amad, Amaz, Amaducep killed dozens of each other's men. So they're, you know, they're going their, their weekly soccer match. Sure. <clears throat> they kill each other. The Dutch colonial government attempted to take control of the situation, so they went to disarm the Ots tribe, but a series of cultural misunderstandings resulted in the Dutch opening fire on the Ots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to break up this fight. We're going to break up the fight. No, I'll just kill you all. Sorry, misunderstanding. Oops. <laughs> Oops, we killed you with our much superior weapons. <laughs> oh, man. That's mean. Uh... So it was in this context, right? So that's the last they had with the white people. They just killed them like brutally. So it was in this context that the Ots stumbled upon Michael Rockefeller as he backstroked towards the shore, bordering their lands. 
Talk about clusterfuck timing. Yeah. The Dutch had just killed them. Your ship capsizes. You're like, I'll swim to shore. You backstroke casually onto land. You get up on land, and then there's four Ots tribal men looking at you like you're the fucking devil. Yeah. So this gets graphic. If you have young kids, yeah. I don't like this part either. I will say this. If I wanted to sum it up without sounding gross, you know how when the Native Americans killed the buffalo, they used the hides for, for warmth. They used the blood and guts for paint and war paint used and every, glue. Used every part of the animal. Yeah, used every part of the animal. Michael Rockefeller was reportedly given the buffalo treatment. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Reportedly. Reportedly. They cut off his head, cut into his skull to eat his brain. Then they cooked and ate the rest of his flesh. His thigh bones were turned into daggers, and his tibias were turned into points for fishing spears. His blood was drained, and the tribesmen drenched themselves in it while they performed ritual dances and sex acts. That seems nice. Hmm. <laughs> An interesting, interesting term of the word nice there. That was such that was such a good reaction from you. <laughs> it's it's kind of me running in my head. <laughs> I ran I ran through all the scenarios. <laughs> you know, if I grew up in that culture, yeah, that probably was a pretty nice day. Just a mm. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy said that seemed nice. <laughs> a white man came up on shore, told us don't eat him. He'll give us anything we want, but chopped off his head, <laughs> ate him, danced in his blood, fucked each other. Uh, <laughs> in their theology, the Ots believed they were restoring balance to the world. Uh, the tribe of the white man killed four of them, and now they had taken the retribution so they could absorb the energy and power that had been taken from them. However, they quickly regretted their decision when boats and helicopters and technology they had never seen before from the white world arrived at their doorstep. And directly following this event, the region was plagued by a horrible chlorea, cholera, mm. cholera, epi- cholera epidemic that many saw as revenge for the killing of Michael. So this is a hushed about story. Uh, and and this is the part of the article that just fucking sucks. Uh, whoever wrote this article ended on this, and then we'll talk about it uh, as a whole. Sure. Uh, so he would, Hoffman was there in 2014. Um, then, one day, when Hoffman was in the village, shortly before he returned to the U.S., he saw a man acting out the killing of another man who was on the ground. Hearing words relating to the murder, Hoffman quickly began to film him, but he had already finished the story. He was, though able to catch the epilogue of the story on film where the man explained. So no video of this. I'm like, okay, show me the video of this. If he filmed right. it, no video, just the translation of what the, ma- of the epilogue of the story. And this is it. Don't you tell this story to any other man or any other village because this story is only for us. Don't speak. Don't speak and tell the story. I hope you remember it and you must keep this for us. I hope, I hope this is for you and you only. Don't talk to anyone forever, to other people or another village. If people question you, don't answer. Don't talk to them because this story is only for you. If you tell them, you'll die. I am afraid you will die. You'll be dead. Your people will be dead. If you tell this story, you keep this story in your house, to yourself. I hope forever, forever. Terrible way to end the article because the whole thing sounds for gazy now. The whole thing sucks. It's that that's the end of your article, which you're basically patting yourself on the back, like, oh, I I really shouldn't have told you guys. I these these man eating people told me not to tell you, but I still told you. That's who I am. It's like, dude, get out of here. They, they really I, shouldn't have added that to the end of the article. I don't know who wrote it, but it was yeah, like, and but, here's our proof. Like, that's not fucking proof. You just wrote yeah, some rambling here, shit. Here, Here's this, here's this quote saying, we'll get killed if we tell you this story. And then at the end of it, it's like, this article was published on November 14th, 2014 by the New York News. Thanks. Yeah. Dumb. 
But yeah. I yeah. I think there's merit to the story that the the investigator that went there in the '60s and said that the Dutch not wanting to share it could be true. It's wild, man. Like the richest family in the world gets caught up with a cannibalistic tribe. It's wild. Well, and where did we partially start this? If we we talked about if you're inheriting a ton of money and part of a a giant money factory family, why why don't you take the family business? I guess you could put this in the argument for for take the family biz. Take the family biz. I mean, yeah. I don't know, man. It's tough cuz like his boat capsized, but it sounds like everyone else survived. Like they didn't say that the rest of the people died. That's interesting. You know what I mean? Maybe they fully ratted him out. That could that could have some ugly twists to Did it. Do they throw him they threw him off? No, I'm saying like so maybe the boat does capsize. They all swim to shore. And they're basically given the vibe like, hey, we're gonna eat all of you people. And the other people were like, No. Like you totally just want that guy because he's like rich and stuff. Look how tasty and, he is. And and the people were were like, uh, okay, they're they're everyone's pointing at that guy. We got to eat that guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Cannibalism, man. Fucked. Headhunters. It's fucked. There yeah, is... ne- never been too into that. Okay, so the weirdest part of this, and if I post this on Twitter, or eventually we're going to have laughsfromthepast.com, which will be like a blog, and we can post kind of the research we found and um, everything. Eventually we'll sure. have that. I, we, we won't have it like right now. But, um, Jake, you, I want Jake to see this image uh, of Michael Rockefeller in Papua New Guinea, so I'm gonna st- I'm gonna send it to him, and then you guys can hear his reaction. Because knowing the story that we were just told, it's a really haunting picture. So I just clicked the link. I will post this on Twitter or Instagram uh, with, when we put po- when we post the story. So when is this from? His first trip. So he went on his first trip in 1960, and then he went back in 1961 when the boat capsized. So this is the the follow up trip. Okay, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't haunting is not the word that comes across to me. Well, I mean, picture him dead and a bunch of men doing that because that's what happened the next trip. Right. I'm I'm just saying he looks incredibly happy there. Oh, so yeah. hey, he he died doing what he loved, getting eaten. Yeah, he looks like your classic 1960s guy. I mean, in the movie, you make the ending, well, okay, let me start over. A, after seeing the picture, and who I had playing him anyways, straight Ryan Gosling. Yeah. Yeah, here's, here's uh, another picture. Yeah, Ryan Gosling would be good. Or um, Ryan Gosling might be too old because these guys are supposed to be like 20. Uh, the, it's a movie. The kid from Friday Night Lights and... and um, and Fargo, Jesse Plummins, I think his name is. If he if he lost some weight, he would be he would be great in this role. Um, a listers only for Daddy. Um, but yeah, I think basically you do this story. I think you embellish, like he comes up on land. There's this whole maybe tribes are fighting over him. Maybe he comes back to that, like that first picture you sent me. He looks really happy. Yeah. He, he, he comes back to that tribe and they almost make him like this godly king figure. They get fought by another tribe. They take him down. Oh, yeah. The guy from Game Night. Yeah. It's, they look pretty similar, uh, Jesse Plemons. But um, yeah. And then you either the ending, you kind of leave it mysterious. Like everyone says he's got any in, but maybe he hasn't almost like a Batman dark Knight ending where, where he goes missing or yeah, you just go full graphic and have, you know, director Jake has, has him being actually eaten. You have Jesse Plemons eaten on the set. Yeah. The cool- now that's, a, that's a movie. The coolest story would be if he was still a- alive. Right. 
Uh, and I think there is a story. I should find this for maybe another episode after season two. I think there is a story about a, a white man that married a, a princess of a tribe because he was held captive. And then he came, went on to become like king of that tribe. And it's, it's a white man. And that kind of funny, it you you really got to be a wordsmith if you find yourself in one of those situations because it's basically coin flip. Either a you're a king god or b instant awful death. Mm-hmm. It all depends on your personality, I guess. Yeah. Or how? Or yeah, maybe it doesn't. Maybe we're maybe nothing mattered for Rockefeller when these tribal men met him. If anyone knows the story I'm thinking about, where it's either a woman marries a white, uh, a woman, a white woman marries into a tribe, or gets brought into a tribe as like a slave or captured or something, and then then has a family and becomes a leader, or it's a man. I can't think of that. I want to Google it. I want to do that down the line. But thank you very much for listening to this episode. Pretty wild tale, huh, Jake? Yeah, I liked it because I like the juxtaposition of first world incredibly rich, third world incredibly poor <laughs> guy who just wants to show these people off to the whole world in an art, and, again, I, and they're I, like, I, "No, we'll just eat you." I think something that we we touched upon, but we didn't fully depict, and obviously with uh, that's that's where the other place your brain drum jumps is if if this were to happen nowadays, like Twitter and the news, what kind of story this would be. I mean, the Rockefeller grandfa- grandson in the 60s, I mean, you have some, some artists and people becoming popular, but this is what? This is uh, almost a president's grandkid going missing or something like that? Oh, I mean, yeah. this, would, this would be a wild news story if it happened. Which lends a lot of credence to why the Dutch would hide it. Like, yo, we can't. We can't have this. Yeah. Happen. Fun. All right. That's the end of Last from the Past. We'll be back next week for season two which is going to be a different format, and you'll hear a lot about that there. Thank you very much for listening. Rate, subscribe, review. Uh, Let us know your favorite episodes. We had uh, some people send in their favorite episodes so far. If I had them on, I would read them, but I don't want to waste the time to go search. But thank you very much for everyone that listens, and we will see you later. (laughs) 